quickly, I want to give you a quick background of the business career I've had so you can see what informs the conclusions that I'll share with you. So first off, I've been starting businesses all my life. My very first one was 12 years old selling candy at the bus stop. I took this little Pan Am bag, filled it with candy bars. The student store at school sold candy bars for 10 cents. I undercut them by selling them for nine cents. I bought them three for a quarter, eight and a third cents each at the pharmacy. So I was making a handy two thirds of a cent on each candy bar. But over my junior high school years, I made $400. It was a very exciting, invigorating experience for me. When I got to high school, I started my second business. It was 1973 when the energy crisis, the oil embargo was going on, and there was gas rationing in California, and you only could buy $5 of gasoline on odd or even number days based on the last digit of your license plate. So I thought, wow, solar energy is going to be the answer to solve this problem. So I started making little solar devices, little parabolic concentrators, little plans and kits, and I took out ads in the back of Popular Science magazine to sell those plans for $4. And over the next few years, I sold 10,000 copies. So I made $40,000 and I paid my way through college with that. Maybe even got accepted to college because of that. I went to Caltech and while in college, I continued that business and then became really, really addicted to high-end audio, and Caltech helped teach me how to design loudspeakers. I had audio engineering classes, and I made this loudspeaker design. I got a patent on this design, and I began manufacturing these speakers and selling them to students on campus and professors nearby. When I graduated from Caltech, literally the month I graduated was the day the IBM PC came out. So I ran down to my computer land store in Pasadena, bought an IBM PC to computerize my business, began to teach myself how to program, and then I started making software to work with Lotus 123 to improve accounting software, and eventually made a natural language interface to Lotus 123. And then Lotus acquired our company, our little small company, when I was 25 years old for $10 million, and I moved back to Boston to work with Lotus in Cambridge. At the time, Lotus was the biggest software company in the world. So I learned a lot about the software industry at Lotus. I had signed a one-year contract, but they kept renewing it. I stayed there for six and a half years and learned everything I could about the software industry from Lotus. And I would have stayed there longer, but then my son started kindergarten. My five-year-old son, I waved goodbye to him on the playground one day and saw, thought, I wonder if he's going to fall in love with learning. I had a magical fourth grade teacher that helped me fall in love with learning. I wonder if he'll have that. If he doesn't, Maybe I can make software that helps kids fall, fall in love with learning. So I started Knowledge Venture to make multimedia CD-ROMs to help children fall in love with learning. At the time, there was Math Rabbit and Reader Bla uh, Math Blaster and Reader Rabbit, but they were skill and drill software. They gave kids practice in things they already knew. What I wanted to do was teach kids new things and have them have that aha moment. So that's what Knowledge Venture was about. We built that company up, we sold that company for $90 million in 1995, and then once again, by complete coincidence, literally on my birthday in 1995, Netscape had its IPO, and I read that they had 30 million browsers. And there were 50 million internet users around the world, but 30 million browsers, were, 30 million people were using Netscape, and I saw an unbelievable opportunity to make companies where you could have one-on-one -one interaction with your customer. And Ben Horowitz was talking uh, the other day about how people laughed him out of the room when he talked about the power of Netscape, but uh, didn't laugh me out of the room. I thought it was incredible. And I decided to start a whole business just to make businesses taking advantage of the Netscape browser. So I started Idea Lab as a technology incubator in 1996 just to make companies taking advantage of this internet revolution. And since then, we built up all the resources to build companies, multiple companies under one roof. We have all the shared services we need. And we had 12 ideas. Our first year in business, we were going to start 12 companies. We would put $250,000 into each one of them and see if we could raise additional capital after that. And these were our first 12 ideas. One of the, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we started these first companies, and of the 12, five of them failed, but seven of them were able to raise additional capital beyond our additional $250,000. And then a few of them went on to go public and become very successful long-term companies. Since then, we started more than 125 companies over the last 18 years. And across all of those companies, we helped them raise more than three and a half billion dollars across all of them. We had 45 successful acquisitions and IPOs. Seven of them turned into more than billion dollar companies. We have 30 current operating companies, but if you do the subtraction, that means we had 50 failures. So we learned a lot from those failures. And that's what I'm gonna try and synthesize for you today into some lessons about what works and what doesn't and what matters most. First, I want to give you a little background on my startup history. 
to see the context from where these ideas come from. I've been starting businesses all my life. Uh, my very, very first business was selling candy at the bus stop in junior high school. I was 12 years old and uh, candy bars at the student store were 10 cents and I saw them on sale at Save On Drug Store in Encino, California where I grew up for three for a quarter. So I bought candy bars, three for a quarter, eight and a third cents each and undercut the bookstore by a whole penny. I sold them for nine cents at the bus stop. And this was my little Pan Am bag that I filled with candy bars, took to the bus stop. And over the three years of junior high school, I made a whopping $400 of profit selling candy bars at two thirds of a cent markup. But it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about what kind of candy bars people liked. Uh, uh, listening to the customer, um, uh, figuring out exactly where I could buy the candy bars cheaper. And it was really, really valuable experience for me. It turned out I, I, I also took wood shop and metal shop in junior high school and fell in love with making things with my hands. And I used that $400 profit to buy some woodworking tools and started making things and selling them at the Rose Bowl swap meet. When I got to high school, my second business was started. It was 1973. And I don't know how many of you remember the Arab oil embargo. In California especially, it was hit hard. You only could buy $5 of gasoline per day on odd and even number of days based on the last digit of your license plate. So there were long lines of cars lined up outside all the gas stations in Studio City. And I thought there's got to be some way to solve this problem of this energy crisis. And of course, fit being 15 years old and just having taken trigonometry, I thought I could use my math skills from how to make parabolas to try and make solar energy concentrators, things like that. So I started making some in 1991. And in 1991, that was when my youngest son at the time, five years old, now he's 28, David um, started kindergarten. And I remember waving goodbye to him on the playground that very first day of school, wondering, is he gonna have that amazing fourth grade teacher that I had that made me fall in love with learning? And I was worried he wasn't going to. So I wanted to make software that would help him fall in love with learning, and not just him, his whole generation, all his friends and everything, because what if he fell in love with learning, but that wasn't cool, I wanted it to be cool for him and his friends. So I started this company, Knowledge Venture, and that's where I first ran into Jeff, because I ended up working with Random House. We started making products called Knowledge Adventure. We made a product um, called Undersea Adventure, Dinosaur Adventure, Space Adventure. We eventually made a product called Jumpstart Kindergarten. We made Jumpstart Kindergarten and a whole elementary series of products, and those took off. We ended up selling 20 million copies of those CD-ROM products, and we sold that company for $90 million in 1995. And that's when I started IdealNet. I really saw the internet taking off. It was 1995, uh, Netscape had just gone public. Netscape ironically went public on my birthday, August 9th in 1995. Netscape now had 30 million users. And I remember at Knowledge Venture, I wanted to contact our customers to try and learn more how to make our products better. But we didn't know who our customers were. We made our product, we sold them to a distributor, they sold them to a reseller, they sold them to a retailer, and then the retailer sold them to an end customer, and we didn't know their names. Egghead knew their names, or Walmart knew their names, or CompUSA knew their names, and sometimes they didn't even know their names because the person just buying at the counter anonymously. It was a, a great liberating feeling to think if you made something that worked on the internet, you could talk to your customers directly, you could hear from them directly. So I was so excited about that. And I had many, many different ideas for companies to start. And that's why I started Idealab, specifically as a technology incubator. I didn't know it would work, if it would work or not. We raised enough money to run for one year. We raised three and a half million dollars. Um, uh, $500,000 that I invested, $500,000 from six other investors. It was specifically to have a one-year budget to run a million dollars for 10 people and to do 10 $250,000 experiments. We would invest in 10 companies and see if we could make those work. And we were looking for ideas all over. Basically, I was looking for things that I felt I wanted online. I remember the online times in 1995, 1996. It was a frontier, but also there was a lot of worry about whether people would even put their credit cards online. A lot of people were worried about where it was even gonna head. And uh, we built this, this facility to have shared resources for all the companies, very much like what you have here. Lots of shared resources so you can innovate and try things in different areas. And the very first few ideas I had were these. We started them, and at the end of one year, five of them had gone out of business, but seven of them had received from some additional funding. We put in the first $250,000, we found CEOs and management teams to lead them. At the end of one year, we had made enough progress to get enough money raised to do a second year, at the end of the second year, a few of those companies had their first IPOs, and then we used that funding to continually fuel Idealab and make it self-sufficient since then. And since then, we've done more than 100 companies. As Jeff said, it's 125 companies now across many, many different industries, including robotics, internet companies, e-commerce companies, even solar energy companies. <clears throat> Anywhere we can look in the world and see where there's a big problem that technology could solve, we try and make a company around it. We're often limited by whether we can find talented people. We fail for many, many other reasons. I'm gonna try and share with you some of the reasons that we failed. 
because we learned a lot of lessons from those failures. But across these 125 companies, we've helped the companies, among all of them, raise more than three and a half billion dollars. We had 45 successful IPOs and acquisitions out of that 125. We had seven of them that reached more than a billion dollar valuation. We have 30 current operating companies, so we've experienced more than 50 failures. So we learned a lot from those failures. And I'll try and share some of this experience with you. With you. But the thing I'm most proud of, we created more than 10,000 jobs across all those companies, most of them in Pasadena, some of them now in New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles and, and in Santa Monica. We have some new companies that are starting in New York. We're now location agnostic and we want to start companies wherever the talent is. So we take the ideas that we have, we put in the seed capital, and then we want to go wherever the people are. So now, across all that experience, what have I found most makes a startup successful? And I recently, um, actually at, at David Kirkpatrick's conference, I heard Peter Thiel speak, but I also read, read his book. Uh, he has some really, really interesting provocative ideas um, about going from zero to one and how much value is created when you take a new idea that's fresh and then put it in place as compared to going from one to end, which is scaling up an existing idea that already works. I do agree with him. I think a huge amount of value creation goes when you see something that no one's tried before and then make it take effect. And uh, there's no simple formula for that. And he says in his book too, uh, as an example, the next Bill Gates is not gonna be making an operating system. The next Larry Page won't be making a search engine. The next Mark Zuckerberg won't be making a social network. The next great thing is gonna be something completely new. It's gonna be innovation that's, that's fresh and completely clean. So if there's no formula for that, what can I tell you that still would be useful since there's no formula for making that next big break? Well, I wanna try and share with you what I've looked at over the years, looking back at our companies and other companies, what ends up mattering most. So I took a look at some of the standard elements that people talk about leading to success. The idea, the team, the business model, the funding, the timing. In fact, I always used to think the idea mattered the most. Uh, and I took a look at these, and I'll look at these in more detail. So these five areas, idea, team, business model, funding, and timing, let me talk about each of them. So first on the idea, there's the novelty and differentiation of the idea. It's how new is it, how much of it has not been done before. How much truth is there in the idea that no one else has seen before? And let me give you an example of what I mean by a truth. But let's say, let's take Airbnb as an example of a company with an interesting new truth. Their truth was people would be willing to rent out a room at their house or their whole house to a complete stranger. Now, when that truth was first talked about with others, most people laughed at that. In fact, notably, I think Fred Wilson, a great VC here in New York, passed on that idea because that was just too outrageous. But in fact, it did turn out to be true. So moving the idea from being outrageous to actually proving that it was true, a huge amount of value was created. Well, I think that's an example of an idea truth. Now that idea also had been tried before, but it wasn't tried exactly the way they tried it. Another example of, of uh, idea com is competitive differentiation or competitive moats. Are there things you can build around your idea to protect other people from copying it? Okay, now to team and execution. And I'm gonna tell you how I score all of these in a moment, but I'm just summarizing them first. When I look back at our companies, I often see some teams that were really, really effective. We once had a McKinsey CEO, an ex-McKinsey person who was a CEO of one of our companies, and he was just very, very effective. He just really got things done. He plowed through barriers. Uh, also, adaptability was another factor we saw in various of our teams. How much did they listen to new information? How much did they change in the light of new customer data? On the business model, some of our companies had a very clear path to profitability, very clear path to revenues, some of them didn't. On the funding, some of our companies were able to raise a lot of money and some of them weren't. And on timing, some companies we had were way too early, some companies were early, and some companies were too late. So I tried to assess all of these things and what I did is I looked at 200 companies. I looked at 100 of ours and 100 of other people companies and I took a look at 10 outliers in each set. 10 companies of ours, five that turned out to be wild successes, worth more than a billion dollars, and five that we thought were gonna be worth more than a billion dollars, but failed. And then the same thing for 100 other companies. We looked at 10, that, 10 companies in particular, five that turned out to be wild successes that people didn't think were gonna be wild successes, and five that turned out to be failures, but people thought were gonna be wild successes. And I came to this conclusion. Here's looking across these, these 10 companies from Idea Lab, and looking across these 10 companies from outside of Idea Lab. I'll come back to this in a moment, and here was the summary. Timing actually mattered the most. I was completely shocked to discover this. This is completely subjective. It's my own, my own look at companies and my own evaluation. But let me at least tell you why I came to this conclusion. Timing mattered the most. Team and execution mattered second. The idea was actually third. The thing that I used to think was the most important thing. I mean, heck, I named it Idea Lab because I thought it was all about ideas. I thought the idea was everything. And in fact, it wasn't the most important thing. 
Business model was, was uh, uh, fourth, and funding was the least of the top five. Uh, and now let me try and explain these. So funding mattered the least, I think, because if you have a good idea, as long as you have enough money to get it out there, and if you find product market fit and find traction, you will find a way to get more money and get there, or you'll find a way to last if you have adaptability. So funding was the least important variable. It's also, in these times today, by the way, 2014 compared to 1995, 1996, or the other companies I started, when I raised money for Knowledge Venture in 1991, it was very hard to raise money. Today, funding is, is very, very easy to come by. There is so much money out there between angel investors and other investors. If you have an idea, funding is not the problem. To at least give your idea a try. It might be hard to get funding to scale, but that's probably if you're not achieving product market fit. Business model. The reason why business model came in second to last is because if you have traction, you can adapt a business model. You can add on a business model. Take Twitter as an example, or even Facebook. Facebook early on, people laughed at it because they thought there's no way they can have a business model. It's making billions of dollars of revenue now because it's got trillions of page views and so much valuable insights on, on its users. So a business model can be added afterwards. You don't have to have a business model at first. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't help to have one. That's not saying that you shouldn't have some of that thought in mind, but I just think it's much, much lower important. Next comes the idea. If you can still come up with an idea that really resonates with customers, and in fact, if you don't, you won't succeed, but it's not the single most important thing. Uh, I think it's very valuable to try and look for things that are, you're very passionate about, and I'll talk more about that later because I think that's necessary for success as well. But I don't think it's a, the most important thing. The idea alone won't get you there. And in particular, when I look back at our own companies and other, idea, other companies, Sometimes the idea had been tried before and didn't work, but then it was tried again and it worked. And I was trying to figure out, was it timing or execution? And that's why I concluded timing actually mattered more. Execution matters so much more than even the idea because, and this is, a, it's kind of funny that I would even be quoting Mike Tyson in an article uh, to talk about innovation, but Mike Tyson had a great line about, um, uh, about fighting, which I think actually applies to this, which is, uh, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. And, and, uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I think it is like that in business. You have this whole plan. In fact, I remember when I used to start companies, everything was about writing the perfect business plan and coming up with a business plan, and having all the details and planning out five years and all that. And I learned what a joke that was because basically your first interaction cu with customers is like getting punched in the face. The customer straightens out everything and changes all your plans because they have their own ideas. You've got your idea, but they have their ideas about how to use your product or what they want. And that's why I think the team and execution adaptability matters so much because when you first get punched, you have to re recoil from that punch and respond to it and listen to it and, and pay attention to it and then adjust your business after it. And that's why I think that, that's the aspect of the team that I think matters so much. But now timing. Why did I put timing first? Well, so many ideas need to be executed in their right time. I look back at companies that we had that they failed and almost always, except for team and execution, they failed because we tried them way too early. The world wasn't ready for them yet. Um, or we were too late meaning there were too many competitors already. So timing is, is a little bit of luck, but it's not only luck. You can actually look at the market and see if the world is ready for what you're making. And let me try and give you some advice on how to evaluate that and use that as a judgment factor in making decisions on a company. In fact, I'll go to the Airbnb example first and I'll give some of my own examples too. The Airbnb example, many companies had made places where you could rent other people's homes before. Airbnb, the, the guys also made this product out of need. I don't know if you know the story about the Airbnb founders, but they were in San Francisco. They were from Rhode Island School of Design. They were, there was a conference in town, a design conference. The city was sold out and they decided to make some, they were broke. They uh, made some extra money just by inflating an air mattress in their apartment and renting it out to people who couldn't get rooms who were coming in town from, I think, Rhode Island for the conference. And um, why, that it was very clever. It was, it was born out of immediate need. But the timing was incredible because it was just as the huge recession was hitting. So this idea, which might have been tried many times but didn't work, the timing was incredible because people needed extra money very badly. So people were actually real, willing to rent out their homes in a way they might not have been just a few years earlier or even maybe four years later. So timing was actually a big factor in that company's success, not only the idea. And I look back on one of our companies. We started a company called Z.com uh, in 1999. It was, we saw, all the companies that were happening on the internet, and we thought, well, right here, we were right in Los Angeles, so we're right in Hollywood. Um, we thought entertainment was gonna move online. In fact, video form entertainment. So we started a company, we put in $250,000 called Z.com. We raised a million dollars and built an entertainment team to try and make uh, short form online video entertainment content. It was maybe a forerunner to YouTube. And then we even raised $10 million 
built up a team of 100 people and started signing comedians to exclusive contracts. In fact, I, I came to New York and I actually remember this was a hysterical meeting. Me sitting in a room with Chris Rock trying to close him on being an exclusive provider of content to this little website, Z.com. He barely knew what the internet was. And I closed him. I gave him 5% equity and a million dollars for a five-year exclusive to everything Chris Rock did online. Uh, I signed Adam Sandler in a trailer at Descanso Gardens when he was filming a movie. Uh, we signed a whole bunch of great people. We signed four of our $10 million for exclusive content. We started making this content. People were downloading it and loved it. But there was only about 10% broadband penetration in 2000. To watch a video online, you had to do all this kludgy stuff to download codecs and plug in these weird things to watch video. So we had this great stuff that nobody could watch. We, we eventually were losing money and in 2002 we reduced the company down to 45 people. In 2003 we reduced the company down to 11 people. Then at the end of 2003 we went out of business. And in 2004, Adobe comes out with their flash plug-in video player and the flip cam comes out and everybody starts making a whole bunch of videos with their USB stick. And then two guys come and say, hey, we should make a website where people can share videos since now they're easy to view. Broadband penetration had reached 40% and then YouTube was born. I'm not saying that the YouTube guys didn't execute brilliantly. They got Sequoia's investors and raised a lot of money. They did a great, great job. But timing was incredible. We really blew that company by not sticking around until the timing was right. And we should have looked at the signals. We should have looked at the slow broadband penetration rate, slow growth, and, and survived until the elbow occurred in the, in the ramp of, of that curve. So we could have looked more smartly at what the other signals were telling us. People love what we're making, but they just couldn't watch it. And sometimes you can't control all the external variables in the new thing you're making. And you have to be very honest with yourself about what the rest of the world is telling you on, on the timing front. So that timing thing came, on, came up over and over again with the companies I looked at. And even Facebook's timing was incredible. Friendster was out before Sp Facebook, Sp MySpace was out before Facebook, Now Facebook had incredible execution. I actually scored Facebook extremely high in execution because Mark Zuckerberg's incredible, and they brought in Sheryl Sandberg, but even that was later. But their execution strategy of rolling out college by college and, and so many things they did were beautiful execution, but their timing was really, really perfect as well as some of the other companies as well. So I do think that the reason why timing is actually somewhat liberating as a competitive advantage is that is where a small entrepreneur can actually out-execute a big company. A big company is often lazy and lovering and has inertia, and that's where an individual can time something beautifully. Obviously, they can also have a brand new idea where the idea is very powerful too, and they can be more adaptable. But the top three things, what's great about the top three things is those are the exact things that a small startup can beat a big company at. Big company has money and brand and existing customers and all that. So they have better funding. They probably already have a business model. It's the top three things that the big company is often hesitant to, to uh, obviously the innovator's dilemma, interrupt their own revenue stream, but also really listen to the market as well as a small company can. So that's actually what's liberating about starting a company against a big competitor. So why do I think the opportunity is so big? And let me give you a few more examples of things that you can do to improve your odds of success. Permissionless innovation. It's what I said about the PC industry. I didn't understand that term back then. This is a term that Mark Andreessen talks about a lot. But obviously, the, the internet revolution that caused that. The Bitcoin revolution is causing that. I'll talk about that in a second. The mobile revolution. Uh, the mobile revolution is just incredible. So, so when I go, the way you can reach the whole planet now. Um, when, when I started um, uh, Knowledge Adventure, well, look, look at the evolution of my own uh, personal career. So I started selling candy at the bus stop. My reach was a three block radius and 100 kids. Uh, then I um, started selling uh, mail order plans, and now I can reach the, the um, you know, quarter million subscribers of a P uh, Popular Science Magazine or Scientific American Magazine. Um, uh, then uh, I worked in the packaged goods, industry, packaged goods software industry, and then I can reach the people who would walk into software stores. And then I was intoxicated by the 30 million Netscape users that were all over the world. 30, there was 50 million internet users in 1995, 30 million of them were on Netscape. So 60% of the entire addressable audience was uh, using this one browser. And if you made a product that worked on that browser, you could talk to those people. And now with the mobile revolution, there's 2 billion people connected with a smartphone, with 1 billion new smartphones being sold in the next year. There'll be 4 billion in two years. More than half the planet will be connected with an always-on supercomputer in their pocket in two years. So it's just incredible that you can talk to all those. So, so with just 2 billion today, compared to the 50 million uh, internet users uh, when I started Idealab, it's 40x the market, 40x. So it doesn't mean that you can, um, uh, all those people will be your customers. You have to come up with something clever and innovative to reach them. But it means that it's possible. 
that you don't have the barriers. Like I think back to Knowledge Adventure, all those distributors I had to convince, and those retailers, and all those bottlenecks. Now, if you have an idea, and especially in journalism, you, you have an idea, and you want to talk to the planet, you can reach the whole planet, or half the planet, you know, the, 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 uh, the people with smartphones in a few years. So that is just an amazing, amazing possibility. And when I look back on these last three revolutions, the PC revolution, the HTML revolution, the blockchain revolution, uh, what's incredible about these three things is they're all underlying protocols. They're just protocols that someone invented that then took off enough to get adopted so that billions of people will use them and then there's no one controlling them. There's no one controlling the PC platform or now the, you know, the, 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 uh, new, the new platforms that are available to you. There's no one controlling the HTML platform, blocking you from making something for it. There's no one controlling the blockchain so you can't innovate with payments or all kinds of things on top of it. And that's why I say permissionless, permissionless innovation is why so many things can grow big so fast. And if you look back at other things, uh, when I say mobile everywhere, you look back at other things and their growth rates. So, so it, it took, basically 40 years for the computer to grow to 350 million PCs per year being sold, and it's leveling off at 350 million. It took a few years for the smartphone to get to 500 million a year, and now a billion a year. So it's, it's faster than anything else has ever taken off in history. So we're part of that revolution with the smartphone. And the tablet is taking off too, but at a much lower rate than, than the smartphone. And look at, what that, look at what that's enabled. And I'm not saying making a billion dollar company is the end goal. I, to me, the end goal is making a positive impact on the world but sometimes this is a measure of how fast you can have a reach. It used to take 20 years for a Fortune 500 company to reach a billion dollar valuation. It took Google 8, it took Facebook 6, it took Tesla 4, it took WhatsApp 2, and it took Waze one and a half. So one and a half years to go from zero to a billion dollars of, of, of valuation impact. So, and, and Waze, some guys in Israel were able to come up with an idea that could touch the whole planet, they could talk to all those smartphones, and they could have that big of an impact that fast. That applies to anything. If you make something that resonates with the mind of the customer, you can have that big impact. So now let's talk about resonating with the mind of the customer. So first, in coming up with ideas, uh, my best method, uh, the one I would recommend, but there's many, many methods, is look for ideas everywhere and especially things that matter to you personally. So here's why I think it's so important to find things that matter to you personally. It's because in every business I've started, even the, the, the most successful ones always had tough times. Knowledge Venture had very tough times. Um, uh, all of our successes had tough times. The only way to make it through those tough times if it's something you're passionate about, it's the only way I think you're gonna be able to live to that next moment and find that new turn, find that, that, that fork in the road to make the company successful. I also think it's important, if it matters to you personally, that you can be a good judge of the idea itself. Now, you can at least make sure that you love the product. It doesn't guarantee that other people want the same thing that you want, but I think there's a lot higher odds if at least you're a good judge. Um, I often have people come to me and say, what idea should I make? Um, and how should I judge if people, uh, like the focus groups, what, what method should I use? Well, I think if you have to rely on focus groups, it's very, very di difficult to make judgments on improving your product. You definitely want to listen to other people. I'm going to give you an example of that in a moment. But I don't think you can rely only on other people to help shape your product, your company. Second, test, test, test. So this was something I had ironically learned. This was a big help to me. I didn't know it. I didn't know anything about the term lean startup or anything like that when I was 15 years old. But when I did my little mail order business in high school, I went to the library and I read, art, read books on direct mail. And all they said was test, test, test. Test everything. Test every, every variable. Test your offer. Test your proposition. Test your product. Test everything. Try everything different. And I learned one small trick. You would never have to do this anymore. Uh, obviously, that's what's so great about the internet, about, about um, having direct contact with your customers. But one of the things I learned in those books from the library in uh, downtown LA was, was um, on each of the little ads I would run in the back of Popular Science and Scientific American and Popular Mechanics Magazine, I would write a different address. They all, all the email, all the mail had to come to my house. But I would write A gross, B gross, C gross, D gross. So each, each um, uh, um, ad had a different uh, code that I could tell which ad they were answering. So I, was, I would keep track. I didn't have spreadsheet back then. There were no spreadsheets yet. Uh, uh, Dan Brooklyn hadn't come around, Bob Franks hadn't come along yet with Visico, but I would keep little tabular things, of which I even would test what color ink when I wrote back to the people. I would write some letters back in handwriting, some letters back typing, I would write some letters in calligraphy. I would find that if I would write in calligraphy, I'd get a much higher response rate because people think they were getting a wedding invitation in the mail, so they would open it. <laughs> 
but I would test everything. And uh, it's so valuable to do that. And now I, I carry that forward today in my businesses is just try and find out what matters to your customer by testing every, every different aspect of it. And Cars Direct was a perfect example of that. This was one of our companies that was a, a very big success. We started in 1998 and it has a classic testing story of uh, I got down to buy a new car in Glendale Auto Mall uh, near where I live and I had a terrible experience, the usual terrible experience, buying a car where I went in, I wanted to buy the car, I knew what kind of car I wanted and then I told the guy and he said, oh, well, we, we can't get that one. Uh, oh, that's not available. He goes on his computer and fake types and says, oh, that's not available anywhere in the area because of course he doesn't want to get it from another dealer. He wants to sell you one that he hasn't a lot and does the whole run around where I have to get the car without the features that I want and all that and I left frustrated and said, boy, wouldn't it be great if you could just go to a website Type in the configuration you want. I'm willing to wait. I'll put $1,000 down. Just have the car show up in a flatbed truck at my house and I'll pay the balance when it gets here. And I don't even care if I pay a little bit over invoice. I don't need the absolute best deal. I'd like a good deal, but I'll, I'm willing to wait. So uh, they can make a profit on me because they don't have to worry about holding the car in the lot anymore. Well, I wanted that. I didn't know if anybody else wanted that. And we wanted to find out if that was a worthwhile business. And we ran it by other people. A lot of people said, no, I wouldn't do that. No, I need to test drive it. I said, well, I think there's some people who don't need to test drive it. They know what kind of car they wanted. They've ridden in the car before. Someone else had the car, whatever. Let's just find out. Well, how can we find out easily? So we formed a company called Cars Direct. We were going to test this in only 90 days. Uh, rather than capitalizing with the whole $250,000, we just capitalized with $50,000 just to try the test. And we would invest the whole $250,000 into test work. Test didn't work, we would stop, but nobody would lose. Uh, uh, we'd only lose $50,000, that'd be the maximum of this test. So we hired a person to come run the test for us, and he was gonna become CEO if we decided to go forward. He wasn't gonna lose his job if the test didn't go forward. He was just gonna work on some other project with us. So that was important, so there was no worry about him biasing the test or anything like that. He started working on it, and he started working on building out the website. And after about 20, 30 days, I met with him and he said, well, I'm working on the website. I'm also talking to suppliers. I have a meeting with Ford, a meeting with Honda. I said, what are you talking to Ford and Honda for? This is why I got to be able to get the cars. He said, we're not, we're not going to actually have a relationship with the companies. We're just going to go down to the Monrovia Auto Mall and buy a car at retail and sell it at a loss to the customer. We'll lose $1,500 in the car, but we just need to find out if people want to do this. Okay, okay, I'll stop talking to them. So then 30 days later, I met with them. Okay, now I'm working on the configurator where people can choose the drop downs and choose their options in their car. It's a lot of work because I have to make sure all the options match up. The options, some options are not possible, like you can't get the seat heaters. Don't worry about that. Just let the person type in what they want. We're gonna have a person in the back, sort of like a Wizard of Oz, who's just gonna be behind the curtain and just take the printout and just go down and buy that. If the car's not possible, write the person back. We'll tell them that's not a possible car. Stop building a configurator, which is a lot of work and we don't even need that. So I kept on having to try to convince them, stop building things we don't need just to get the answer to this test. So like on the 80th day of this 90 day period, I said, just put the site live and let's just see what happens. So I remember on a Thursday, he put the site live and um, I came in the next morning, I said, what happened, did anything happen? And he says, yeah, we sold four cars. I said, hurry up and turn the site off because we were losing $1,500 for each car. <laughs> and I said, but it worked. People put $1,000 in for a car, sight unseen. They want the car, we'll go buy it, we'll deliver it, we'll complete the customer experience, but I think we have a yes, this is a go. I think there's a company here. And that was an example of trying to find the minimal way to just get the answer to the question, does anybody else feel like I do? Like I wanted that, but I didn't know if anybody else would. Turned out the company was very successful. We built, we ended up making su supplier relationships. We ended up building a full configurator. That took a lot of time. We raised money, eventually the company went public and was very successful. But it was just an amazing experience to try and even convince someone, just do the simplest thing to get the answer. And then I, I tried to take that away as a lesson for our other companies to always try and convince people. It's almost even if you have to write a line of code to get your answer, that's too much. Try and find your answer without writing a line of code. Sometimes you have to write code, but if you can do without that, try, like sometimes we make mock-ups, almost like paper mock-ups or just screenshots. We, we make, we make um, drawings and put them on an iPhone just so they look like they're on the phone and they're actually just, you're looking at the photo album and you're flipping through pictures just to make it, just to see what people think. Of course, the ultimate is when you can take a credit card from someone or actually, uh, by the way, we didn't even run the credit, people's credit cards through. We just needed to see that they typed in the digits of a credit card because we, we, we didn't care about the getting the thousand dollars. We cared about seeing would they be willing to give up a thousand dollars did they think they were giving up $1,000? So that's another thing. You don't even need to take the money. You just need to find out would they have done it. So that's one thing I, I would say really important for ideas is, is really test them. And then finally, listen, listen, listen. Um, uh, this is the adaptability aspect. So the more you can learn from your customers, I, I think, again, that's the, that's the core thing that you can do as a small company, as a small, as an individual against a big company is out-listen them. 
So I'll give you the example with Knowledge Adventure. We were making this line of products. Dinosaur Adventure, Undersea Adventure, Body Adventure, Space Adventure. We, we, we did Space Adventure with Buzz Aldrin. We paid Buzz Aldrin a, a fee and royalties to make a product with him. We had all these great products. We were very excited. Kids love them, parents love them, but they weren't selling that well. Uh, we were selling okay, but we were not profitable. And we were gonna have a really tough year. One particular Christmas in 1993, we were probably gonna go out of business. We were not gonna make it. We had 65 people in the company. And uh, my brother who was working with me at the company also came up with this idea. We gotta make our numbers this Christmas. Let's start this thing called Weekend Warriors. Let's send everyone in the company out on the weekend. Everybody will get Monday off, but just for these four weeks up until Christmas, everybody take a laptop, go buy a box of donuts, bribe your way into the store at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning when they open, go set up your laptop at the end of the aisle of the kids' software and just demo all day and sell whatever you can. And of course, we're at, when you go to a store and demo, sales would go up at that store from one product per day or two products a day to 30 products per day because you're sitting there demoing at the end of the aisle all day long. We were able to boost our revenues enough to make it through that Christmas. But every Tuesday when people came back to work after Weekend Warriors, we'd have a whole company meeting, about like this, and everybody would get together and tell stories, funny stories, crazy stories, whatever they learned uh, about, from, from their experience that weekend. And I got assigned to the CompUSA in City of Industry. Someone else got the egghead on Lake Avenue. Someone got the fries in Woodland Hills. You know, wherever it was, someone would come back with stories. And what we would find is this was a perfect example of what people would see. There'd be a mom walking down the aisle, picking up the boxes in the software aisle, and looking at them, looking at the back. We even had a fold out, reading it, and then putting the product back down and walking away. And we were so frustrated that they were holding a box in their hand, they were all about to buy it, and they wouldn't buy it. And we concluded, after four weeks of doing this, that the reason people weren't buying is they couldn't figure out if it was for their child or not. And in fact, I had always been trying to make the product for the widest age range possible. In fact, our, our products used to say, for ages eight to 108, to try and indicate anybody could learn from this. But that was actually not such a great thing. I, we didn't know that. So we said, what can we do to try and make people understand? Because there was no, there was no freemium software. There was no, there was no way to do a try before you buy. You're in the store, you see ROM product. Um, and we tried to come up with something that would convey to the parent that it was actually for their child. And we came up with this idea. What about if you make a product called Jumpstart Kindergarten? It would be for only one grade. It would be absolutely clear who it was for. Like a parent would look at it and go, well, that's for my either preschooler going into kindergarten or that's for my kindergartner to give them a head start in kindergarten. And we ran this by our sales force and they said, can't do it. It will never sell. There's only 4 million people of each age range, 4 million children of each age. So by going for such an hour audience, you can't do that. I said, well, just take it to the resellers and see if they would do it. So they took it to the distributor. We had soft sell and Marisol sell and these resellers. And they said, no, it won't sell. We can't take something that narrow. So we killed the idea. But it kept on nagging at me that this actually was what parents were looking for, something that was very specific to them. The same great idea of making kids fall in love with learning. I was really opposed to making skill and drill software. Like the other software at the time was like Read a Rabbit, Rabbit and Math Blaster. And it was all about practicing math over and over. I didn't want kids to practice math. I wanted kids to see discoveries and, and have their brain get thrilled with that, that learning moment. So I really wanted to do this. And um, uh, despite everybody objecting, we had a little skunk works effort in the company. We spent basically again $250,000 to make this product and just give it a try. We made the product, the sales force still objected, the resellers still objected, but I just made them take a production run of 10,000 units and put it in the store. And it took off like crazy. We sold 20 million copies. It took off like crazy because we eventually made the whole, the whole series. We went all the way up from kindergarten to, first, to sixth grade. We made a whole, so we basically took our old products and just broke them apart for more narrow age ranges and this resonated with the, with the parents, exactly. So this is the uh, ultimate example of nobody told us to do this. In fact, everybody told us not to do this. But it was an insight that came from listening to our customers. And again, they didn't say it, but they were showing it with their actions. This is what a startup can do better than anybody else. Can be really in contact with their, their end user and really look at what's bugging them. Really look at what, what's not working and then try and come up with the insight to make a great business. And I think that's what's so great about the startup setup and, and uh, again, a big company might not be willing to take the risk. In fact, we were almost even too big of a company to take the risk. We were too worried about cannibalizing other revenues or too worried about ruining the relationship with our resellers. But you, you have to do that. You have to hear what the customer's saying. And acquiring complementary skills. So this comes to the execution part. Um, after I graduated from Caltech, I had a lot of friends from Caltech. I hired all of them to work with me in my business. I hired a lot of people like me. And I learned when I was 35, much too late, but it took me a while at Knowledge Venture, that I had to start hiring some people that were not like me. I had to get a CFO. I had to get a sales guy who could get, make numbers. I had to do all these other, other different kinds of talents. And the thing I learned was that there's 
uh, these, this is a, a caricature, uh, caricature of different personality types, but these different personality types exist in a company and they need to exist in harmony. So let me tell you about these different personality types and how I think that relates to, to helping make a startup work more successfully. So there's the entrepreneurial type. Uh, that's the person who comes up with the ideas. Um, uh, and that would be the exaggeration. That, that's my skill primarily. I have the other skills too a little bit, but that's my main one. Then there's the producer. That's the person who has to um, actually uh, make things happen. You know, get a product out or sell it or, or uh, make, make the trains run on time. Then there's the administrator. That's the person who has to organize um, uh, everything to, to work like clockwork. And then there's the integrator that has to make those other people work together because those other people usually hate each other's guts. Because those, those people really come from such a different mindset. And uh, the, the example I would give it would be um, if those four extreme personality types were sitting here um, uh, and the, um, let's say there was a scratch on that window over there, the producer would look at the scratch and say, boy, there's a scratch in that window, we better fix that. And uh, the administrator would say, there's a scratch on the window, you know, we should make a form. And whenever anybody sees anything wrong, they'll fill out the form, we'll put them in order, and we'll go through them in exact order and take care of them. And the entrepreneur would look at that, you know, I would look at that scratch and I'd say, see in that building over there, I wonder if that floor is available for rent. We could start a new business right across there. You know, wouldn't even see the scratch, we'd be looking at the horizon, not worrying about the present. And then the integrator would look at those, look and say, I wonder what those three people are thinking. Again, the exact opposite, not even looking at the scratch, just worrying about the other people. And I never knew that there were these other, that there, people could think the other way, because I think so much like the entrepreneur and like the producer, the administrator in me, there's no administrator in me. And I've learned how to be a little bit of an integrator to try and think about how other people are feeling. But getting a company with all of these in balance is very crucial. And no one person can be in perfect harmony and all those would be schizophrenic. So, so uh, getting, getting other people who you have mutual trust and respect for who have those other skills is crucial. And why it's crucial is the entrepreneur can start the company. In fact, the entrepreneur has to be there at the beginning of the company to get the thing started. But eventually, if the entrepreneur can't make anything or do anything, the company will fail. And then if it brings some P skill into the company, then it can go a little further. And then eventually it too will implode if it can't get some administrative skill, if it can't keep things efficient. And then it gets some A in the company, and then it too will fail if those people are all at war with one another. But finally, if it gets some I in the company, it can have all of them in harmony and build a long-term successful company. And I think if you look at some of the really great companies today, they do have all those skills. It's, it's a dysfunctional company if they don't get those things in balance. Sometimes dysfunctional companies can be successful for a while, but they won't be successful for the long term. And then last of all, uh, I, we have this quote. We love this, this quote uh, so much. We have it on the wall in our building. Um, and I, my, my headline for it would be stick with it. And it would be, it relates to very every aspect of, of, of a startup. Um, it's stick with it because the timing might not be right, like the Z.com example I gave you, if we had stuck with it a little bit longer, like if we lowered our burn rate or made it a little bit longer, we would have been successful. But also the stick with it in that you might be ridiculed. So I think every big bold idea is a little bit ridiculed at first. So we had a company called GoTo or Overture, which invented pay-per-click advertising. That was completely ridiculed at first. Uh, Airbnb ridiculed at first. Actually, I think Facebook was ridiculed at first. Many, many great companies were ridiculed at first. Uh, if it really is a truth, it has to make it from ridicule to being self-evident. After it's ridiculed, it actually might move through a phase of being violently opposed. It starts getting opposed when it starts becoming threatening to people. Like at first it's ridiculed, nobody's worried about it. But then it actually starts being a threat and then people start opposing it. You have to have the power to stick with something through that period of opposition till you make something actually become self-evident. If you take a new idea of yours and you take it all the way from new truth all the way to self-evident, then you truly have changed the world. And that's the most exciting thing about making a startup. That's the most exciting uh, reason why I'm here. Hopefully some of these things will help you in something you're working on. I'll be around all day, so I'm looking forward to talking to all of you and sharing other things. I'll also be able to take questions now. But um, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'll do my best to get back to you on Bill at IdealLab.com. And on Twitter, I'm, I'm going around to conferences and sharing everything I learned at, at Bill underscore Gross. Uh, but first, thank you very much. You've been a great audience. I've had the privilege of sitting next to you with your laptop open, your giant laptop open, your giant spreadsheet of ideas. There's, and so, right, I take it, the idea is not the most important thing, but if you don't have that, you're nowhere to start. What's your worldview like, the, 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 the scratch on the window? about how you scour the world. When you look out the world and we put on your, you know, sort of Google Glass, gross glass, and say, how do you look for new opportunities? What strikes you? Well, so I'm walking around all the time just saying, what don't I like about the way the world works? You know, ranging from traffic 
to airplanes, to you know, the way I consume my news, to I wish that someone could have told me that piece of information. That, that someone should have known that I wanted to know that. Uh, and just say, how could a technology possibly solve that? Uh, a lot of times, so that, that anytime I see anything that bugs me, I'll just write it down in the spreadsheet. Now, just being added to the spreadsheet doesn't mean that you can make a business out of it. Sometimes there isn't a good technological solution that would be scalable. Sometimes I can't find the people to run it. The people are the bottleneck because you can't run all these things. Uh, that's why we started Idea Market, like you said. You, you mentioned that earlier. I, I didn't bring that up. So well, we, I'll get to it in a second. Yeah. I'll get to it next. Uh, yes. uh, so so um, I think for, for all of you, it's great to find something that's just personal. You wish something were a different way. And um, see if you can get a team together to tackle that. So it starts with personal frustration? Almost always. Um, when you for, see, me, for me. For you. It's for not you. the only way to come up with no, that. No, no, no. That's, that's, that's okay. method one. Do you ever say, boy, I see a company doing that and I could do a better uh, a competitive urge? Not usually. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, uh, every once in a while, I see a new technology uh, 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 that is very cool. And then I say, could that be applied somewhere else to make something else better? So a new technology will also inspire you. Yes. So uh, I'll tell you a silly one like that, uh, that I didn't build a company out of, but I wanted to. But um, <laughs> a, a trip to New York recently, uh, we don't have too many um, uh, high rises in Pasadena. So, <laughs> so uh, I was, uh, you're going to laugh at this, but I was at, at a building here where um, when I told the security guard, uh, you typed in what floor you wanted to go to, and it sent you to the right elevator bank. There were no labels, and it, it took me right to that floor. There were no buttons inside the elevator either. So I thought, boy, that's a really interesting idea to queue people up based on some foreknowledge of where they're going. You can make these elevators much more efficient. So I was thinking, uh, what other areas in the world could you queue people up like that? It takes some information. I was trying to think maybe you could do it with parking. So maybe you could take a parking lot, and when you enter the parking lot, it would tell you to go to a specific space. It would save you time looking for the space, but also maybe the spaces could be designed around different size cars. So there could be a camera that sends SUVs to SUV spa spaces and sends smart cars to smart car spaces. Maybe you could fit more cars in the parking lot. So I was just thinking of, uh, so every once in a while I get inspired by something where I see a new thing and I say, where else could that be also empl employed? Move to our field, and, and, and the reason I ask you this is because you're not in it. Yes. And, and not to get too technical about it, but basically we're fine. <laughs> Right? That's I, the way I, we look at it. No, but I don't think so at all. Okay, so that's where I want to go. Okay, so, so take, take mobile as an example. Okay. So uh, this will be the year for all of history where the total amount of time consumed uh, of content consumed on mobile will exceed consumed on desktop. And more than 50% of every web page will be viewed on a mobile device. And it's, it's going to go accelerate faster. And we're going to, as I said, 4 billion mobile devices in a few years. I think there's enormous opportunities to rethink how people consume the content, specifically on a mobile device. Everything's gonna be rethought for mobile. You know, Uber is an example of a rethought, rethink for mobile, but the way we, like, the granularity of the story, the way it's displayed, the way you navigate, new ways to take into account the way the thumb is used with the phone, new ways to take into account the short time spans. I mean, so many things could be reinvented for this new medium, and it, it, it's a little bit like, uh, remember when, when uh, Edison first invest, invented the movie camera, the first thing they did was um, stick the camera in the back of a theater and film a play. Uh, no cuts, no moving the camera, you know, uh, uh, no, disc, no, no new, new kinds of continuity or anything. Well, we're still pretty much in the face. It took 10 years before they took the camera out and started making cuts. People screamed when they saw trains coming at them and all the surprising things that happened when you, did, when you moved the camera around. And um, we're almost in that phase where it's only 10 year, less than 10 years since the iPhone. And uh, the idea that people haven't completely rethought the mobile experience yet, they're still mostly porting big screen down to small screen. Right. So I think there are opportunities to completely rethink the, the analogy to moving the camera. Well, so my, my last question before I, I, I go out here is, is you started with relationships. And I think mobile is an important relationship machine. And when you and I have talked about this, you have a company that, that you were nice enough to involve me in uh, called Uber Media. Yes. Right, about mobile as a way to get signals and to know someone's yes, context. Yes. Does that spark any ideas of, oh, uh, of, of, uh, of news and information and informing people? Absolutely. Well, people are using um, the signals of the mobile device in advertising. Uh, where you've been, where you are at that moment, how fast you're moving, you know, are you walking, are you running, are you jogging, are you on the train or whatever. Uh, so many, the, the kind of place you're in, you know, the fact that I'm in this location right now, that GPS could determine something about me because the very, what, what's surrounding me. There are so many things that could be tailoring content the way ads are trying to be tailored. 
And uh, I think people appreciate it if the ads are a little bit more targeted, but people would really appreciate it if their content were more targeted. So I think there are huge opportunities to use. Th this device that we carry around with us all the time now is an amazing sensor that is a story of our life like never before. It is recording a story of our life like never before. decided that I really wanted to go into business for myself. So a year before I graduated with my undergraduate degree, I uh, opened my very first business, which was a booster, booster juice franchise. And that was tremendously successful. So I ended up opening a second store a year later and purchasing a third store. It was a little kiosk that existed in uh, a mall here in town. And what was neat about it is that um, it grew so quickly community just totally embraced it. So over the next six years, uh, we built them up to a, a pretty uh, substantial gross revenue and uh, felt like we use the businesses to my very best of ability to make a difference, both to my employees and also to the community. It was, that, uh, was such a neat surprise to me when doing business was how, uh, how well people responded to being authentic when they're doing being that I was young and inexperienced, uh, I didn't go out trying to be something I wasn't. I just did my best to do my best in whatever way that showed up. So, for example, with my employees, I worked my way up in the very beginning. My first store was uh, employed 15 people. And then with all three stores combined, I worked my way up to uh, being about a staff of 50. And with that, of crew, I really did my best to treat them as a team, truly, and give them you know, respect and guidance. And our staff meetings had a lot less to do with upselling or sales goals, and a lot more to do with their own goals. And doing my best to be a great leader to them, and realizing that in my case, when I was, you know, the, a franchisee of uh, you know, it's fast food, it's healthy fast food, but it's not likely that many of my employees will stay with me forever. It's a stepping stone job, and I didn't want to delude myself into thinking that this was their whole world. And so in fact, I just embraced the fact that I knew they had lots of other things going on in their lives. And one of my policies was that if they asked for time off, I gave it to them. And it meant that I had to staff a larger crew. It was in fact an expense that I incurred because when you're dealing with 50 staff members trying to put together a schedule, it's like putting you know, a complicated puzzle together for every week. But I was willing to incur the cost of the time that goes into, into doing that, as well as to staffing more people to cover the shifts that others uh, you know, have asked for uh, because they need time off. I was willing to incur those costs because I believed that busy people you know, if they're in their late teens or early 20s, which was a lot of the applicants that, the resumes that I saw coming through the door. If you're a leader, then you are busy in those years, pretty much whenever in your life. You know, leaders are busy, and I wanted leaders in my store. So yes, it meant that it was more difficult to schedule, but I also believe that I attracted and retained fabulous people who were willing to go above and beyond because I was willing to give first and to help them keep balance in their lives. I would say to them, education is one of my core values. I want you to get great grades in school, so take time off to study, because that's not what I had necessarily in all the jobs when I was going to school and getting my degree. So I wanted to be the opposite of some of the things that I'd seen along the way. And, <clears throat> and then another, another initiative was our Acts of Kindness program, where I paid every single staff member to come in and do a four-hour shift where they'd show up in their uniform and their sole responsibility for those four hours was to do random acts of kindness for neighboring businesses or uh, you know, for their team members. Their job was, the only requirement was that they weren't allowed to do regular smoothie making duties. They couldn't do their regular job. They had to find creative ways to make other people's day. And that program was probably one of the most fun times in running the business, and I can honestly say it was the first time I 
truly felt successful, even though they were, you know, the stores were bringing in close to $2 million a year in revenue, and they were one of the most busiest location within the franchise in British Columbia, and number six across all of Canada. There were some great numbers that were coming in, but the financial side wasn't the thing that made me feel successful. And at the end of the day, I can look back at that, you know, that program, the Acts of Kindness Challenge, and say that that was the greatest the greatest initiative that I ever ran as a